Thank you, Mariah. Welcome back. I hope everyone had a lovely break and is well rested. Hope you enjoyed your time in Tijuana or the Louvre or points in between. The series is Politics on the Public Mind and the course is largely, the course that accompanies the series is largely oriented around trying to bring together some pretty broad themes involving our interest in New Jersey, uh, involving our interest in society as, a, society as a whole, and the intersection of the law and politics. And in this regard, I might say that there are at least three Bruces, uh, people named Bruce, that are especially relevant to this conglomeration of topics. The first, perhaps least obviously, is Bruce Springsteen, the boss. Uh, Bruce Springsteen probably isn't a figure that closely associated with law. He is divorced, I believe. But he is certainly a figure associated with New Jersey, whether in his role as a traveling troubadour, a chronicler of Highway uh, of Route 46 or the uh, Parkway, or simply a figure who is uh, understood to be a proponent of the state and of the underdog status that some people in the state um, think of themselves as. So the second well-known Bruce is probably not as familiar to people in the room, uh, to all the people in the room anyway, and that's Robert the Bruce, the famous Scottish king. And Robert the Bruce was known for, among other things, uh, uh, declaring, signing a declaration of independence that secured Scotland's independence from England. And uh, in the course of writing this document, Robert the Bruce, a uh, 14th century figure, declared that the right of the people of Scotland to pick their leaders uh, is an ancient one, is a divine one. So he, he tucked into natural law theories with this statement. And interestingly enough, in the declaration uh, signed in the 14th century declaring independence from Edward II, it stipulates that if Robert the Bruce changes his mind and decides to pledge his loyalty to Edward II, the crown, as, it's, uh, as the overlord of Scotland, that he loses his position as, uh, as the king, as the monarch of Scotland. So here is another of our contemporary conceits, a conceit certainly dating to the, uh, our own 18th century and the experience of the Constitution, a belief that we can tie ourselves to words, that the commitments we make in a moment of cogency and sanity and commit to paper will meaningfully bind us in the future. Okay, so that leads us to the third significant Bruce for a discussion of, of law and society in the 21st century. This figure is widely known for, uh, throughout the region and uh, in New Jersey and nationally for his expertise on legal matters and his legal acumen. And he is, of course, our speaker today, Bruce Barron. And uh, Mr. Barron will be talking to us about the uh, nature of the media and the law, and he is a, the founder of Barron Associates, a law firm that has defended, tried, and uh, brought to resolution uh, thousands of cases at both the uh, local, at the, at the state level, at the uh, federal level, both in trials and through appellate uh, matters. Mr. Barron practices in many, many areas of criminal and civil law. I would say that uh, if you have a legal complaint, and a legal issue, if you need legal advice, Almost regardless of the topic, you can probably get assistance from uh, Mr. Barron and his associates at his firm, whether it's a, uh, an issue related to the overheated coffee you get at Politics in the Public Mind, uh, to perhaps a question about whether you can raise a uh, suit for the intentional infliction of emotional distress over a particularly difficult law and society final. Students in the room, please take note and heed my warning. Um, Mr. Barron received his Bachelor of Arts and his law degree from St. John's University in New York, and he appears regularly, some of you may uh, see when he comes up here, if you've already had a chance to look at him, that he's a familiar face. He appears regularly on both television and in printed media on such channels as Fox News, MSNBC, uh, CNN, Court TV. He appears regularly in papers, print media such as the Daily News, uh, the New York Newsday, and is a regular appears is still regularly appearing on AM 710. Once in a while, less frequently, less frequently, but has been in the past. Okay, so appropriately enough, then Mr. Barron is going to be talking to us today about the relationship between the media and law, 
And that's a general theme that we talked about in some detail or in some regard before our break when we spoke with Ms. Doglish about the shield law, about the prospect of a national shield law, and more generally about this evolving relationship between journalism and the legal protections that uh, attach to, to journalists. Mr. Barron, I think, is going to be going in a somewhat different direction than that, uh, reflecting both his experience as a media commentator, but also as a, as a lawyer who has to many times deal with uh, media issues, the portrayal of cases in uh, the, uh, the pages of newspapers, in the t accounts of blogs, in the hours of the uh, television, hours and minutes of, of television news channels. And this, uh, this issue is appropriate not only because, for, for Mr. Barron to address, not only because of his background and his, his current work as a commentator on, on these programs and in these media fora, but also because he, to some degree, as I understand it, he can correct me if I'm wrong, he, he got his uh, start as a, or at least some of his initial start as a national figure, as a national media figure, in connection with a highly publicized case, not surprisingly. And that case involved, uh, involved Woody Allen and uh, Mia Farrow and uh, the, uh, an, an individual named Paul Williams, who was a New York City caseworker who Mr. Barron represented, Mr. Williams was the person who filed molestation charges against Mr. Allen and subsequently lost his job in the course of this, uh, in the course of these charges and in the resolution of them that, uh, that took place. He got his job back, right? Uh, so through, uh, through uh, the efforts of Mr. Barron, he did secure his, his job again. And the point is that in the course of this, I, as I understand it, Mr. Barron found himself becoming more savvy and more attuned to the complexities of dealing with the media while, while litigating, or at least while uh, pursuing legal matters. As he summed it up, the, the Woody, Woody Mia case taught me how to deal with the national media and how to deal with being hounded daily. Uh, so the presence of the media, it became, uh, uh, and its sort of constant uh, oversight became something he, he was keenly aware of in the course of this litigation and perhaps remains keenly aware of today. So among the other accomplishments of Mr. Barron is that he is a father to uh, several children and one of them is an FTU student uh, on our fair campus and has joined us today. I will waste no more of your time with uh, my introduction, my words, and instead happily turn over today's session to Mr. Bruce Barron. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming him. Thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. And please first let me apologize that I'm not Bruce Springsteen. I don't know how to play the guitar. And if I did, I wouldn't be standing here. I'd be like him on his horse somewhere. Anyway, good afternoon, Dr. Peabody, faculty, students, and members of the community. Thank you very much for coming out here today uh, to discuss and analyze this very important topic. I'm certainly not going to tell you what the answer is to the topic because there is no answer. Uh, this is a topic that is issue sensitive, case sensitive, and would change in every circumstance, so there's no right answer. And it's classes or symposiums like this that I think is very beneficial to everyone because what it allows you to do, it allows you to think uh, as to what the issues are and what the rules and regulations are. Media and law basically are a balancing act between our First Amendment right to access, access the courts and cases, and the defendant's Sixth Amendment right to a fair trial. Our founding fathers favored neither, nor believed that one should supersede the other. Practically all states in our country allow cameras in the courtroom. The federal courts have initiated pilot systems to test it out, although they're not required to do it. The United States Supreme Court remains the holdout. And ironically, just recently, a poll that was done here at FDU through Dr. Peabody, and he was a common com commentator. I was reading the New York Law Journal uh, just, I think, last week, and uh, saw his name, and I couldn't believe, but the the situation was that Americans believe in transparency. 
Most Americans today wish or want the United States Supreme Court to be televised or open for its understanding and to see the process going through. Media exposure can be very harmful or helpful to litigants. You really need to know how to use it, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're a judge, or whether you're a litigant. It's important that criminal defendants in our country are either convicted or acquitted based upon the evidence and not through emotion and fear. Viewers often see uh, people, commentators, attorneys, talking on or talking heads on various cable shows at night. If you recall the David Letterman case, immediately when there was arrest, you saw Gerald Shargell, one of the finer New York state attorneys, getting on and saying, we're going to go after Letterman. He slept with his producers. He did this. He did that. And then you had two types of people. You had me saying, well, what does that have to do with blackmail? And then you had a couple other people having coffee saying, do you believe David Letterman is sleeping with his producers? What is that doing? That is tainting the jury pool. It's instilling in people's minds that potentially may sit in that jury, well, David Letterman's not such a good guy. He's not so clean. Well, guess what? You don't have to be clean when you're blackmailed. And the other issue is fear and intimidation. Though I can't say that I haven't attempted this myself, it's a very, very good tool. Gerald Shargell was attempting to scare or send a clear message to David Letterman. You help the prosecutors out and prosecute my client, you're going to be put through some heavy-duty questioning. Well, you know what David Letterman did? He got up, gave his shtick, and he said, you know what, we're going to the mat. And sure enough, that whole smoke and mirrors that was created by the defense attorney, now, if you know, the def defendant just pled guilty. So it's no longer important that David Letterman slept with his producers. So the point is, in that case, the media really didn't work for the defendant, but the attorney, who had no, nothing else to go on because it was a clear-cut case of evidence for blackmail, attempted to intimidate the ultimate witness, which it didn't work. Now, there have been many uh, high-profile cases in our country over the years. Some of you may be old enough to remember that white Bronco traveling one day on TV uh, with O.J. Simpson in the back seat. Some of you might not. Uh, that was a circus, as many has put it. You had some of the best showmen in the country, Johnny Cochran, F. Lee Bailey, well-known attorneys. If you remember Johnny Cochran standing up with the glove saying, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Well, the problem with these kinds of cases is that stuff that's not evidence, stuff that's not permitted in the courtroom gets in. And the jury pool is also tainted. In fact, you have judges that start to believe things when they go home and watch Larry King. So the key is having decorum in the courtroom. Well, then came the Michael Jackson case. And with the Michael Jackson case, Judge Rodney Med Melville learned from the other notorious case, and he said, that circus is not coming to town this time. He basically created various restrictions on the press so that that circus wouldn't come to town. Cameras were banned in the courtroom. A draconian gag order was in effect against all participants. And trust me, as someone who has had multiple gag orders leveled against him, it's not fun to be punched in the face when your hands are tied behind your back. But again, oh, and, and I'm sorry, and he also banned electronic devices. No Blackberries, no laptops, no Twitter. Why? Because that reporter from Court TV could have been sitting in that room, twittered out something to the media, which could have been false or half true, and ultimately could have become printed in the story, which could have prejudiced the case, or the outcome of the case. Now, another interesting case, and again, I'd like to go through some of these cases with you so you can understand what happens in the makeup, is the Duke Lacrosse case. Many of you recall it. I believe it was about four years ago. Duke University 
has said that there have been in excess of 75,000 stories printed about this case. What happened to the presumption of innocence? You know what happened? Those three guys that were indicted by a rogue prosecutor who fortunately the system worked later on and they were acquitted. Well, they weren't acquitted, they were thrown out. But the reality of it is, is look what happened. Because of all the media bias, before, because of all the propaganda, there was a rush to judgment. Duke University fired its outstanding lacrosse coach. The three Duke lacrosse players lives were destroyed with their family. Countless thousands of dollars were spent on defense attorneys. They were being charged with sexual misconduct by a stripper and unfortunately for them, D.A. Nifong picked up on this uh, stripper's lies and said to himself, you know what? This is a great day. I'm running for re-election and I'm going to pander to the voters. He became obsessive with this. He became a police officer instead of a uh, district attorney. And ultimately, the, the, the law worked. What happened was the only one that did jail time was Peter Nifong. He was sentenced to one day in prison. He was disbarred. And fortunately, the, um, everyone, of course, was found to be innocent. And there you see how when something is tried in the court of public opinion, it's not the same as tried in the court of law because there becomes a rush to judgment as opposed to a rush to justice. If I can digress just a moment because of something significant that's happening in everyone's life. Last night when you went to bed, I'm sure you, well, you don't all look tired, but you must be tired because you were probably up late at night watching the votes. You watched how your congressmen and everyone voted on these issues. Did you ever think to yourself, how many of those legislatures that voted on that 3,000 page bill read it? The question becomes, did they determine their positions on that bill by watching Fox, CNN, reading the Wall Street Journal, or any one of these mediums? The point is, is that the, the Depending upon the ideology of that particular medium, that could have formulated the opinion. So we see how important it is where we understand the power of the media and how it can affect the law. Because today, that is law. I hope everyone that voted it, on it knows it was a good thing. And I hope those that didn't, maybe they should have read it. But the point is, is that not to give an opinion one way or another, it's so important because the ones that surely read it to rip it apart according to their ideology of the news mediums. Another interesting thing that's happened recently is three weeks ago, the United, Sup United States Supreme Court was faced with a case by the name of McDonald versus the city of Chicago. Believe it or not, despite the fact that the Constitution was created a couple of days ago, we're still litigating Second Amendment cases. And basically what happened in this case is a gentleman by the name of McDonald wanted to have a gun in his house and protect himself. In 2008, the United States Supreme Court in a case called Heller basically determined the Second Amendment contained an individual right to keep and bear arms. The problem is that in the state of Washington, it's a federal jurisdiction and therefore it didn't impact the states. So we are now awaiting the, the, the ruling from this case to determine whether or not all the states will be impacted by this decision. I bring this up because of the following reason. Were it not for the media attention on this issue, how many opinions would be out there, how many amicus curiae briefs, friends of the court, would have been submitted? If we don't know that something's going on, it's impossible to get involved in it. And that's a benefit that the media does do. I'd like to also throw out a few uh, cases, and I want you to throw, keep them in your mind. We won't talk about them. They were significant cases that have impacted media and law over the past few years. We discussed OJ, Duke, Scott Peterson. You remember Terry Schiavo? 
that tragic case of uh, that young lady that was basically in a vegetative state, and you saw every night on TV, her parents sadly on one side saying they want to keep her alive, and the husband on the other side uh, saying that she wanted to you know, have the plug pulled. The point is, it's really immaterial what both sides says. It's the law and, of course, the evidence of what the individual wants, but it just goes to show you the power to the point that it got the former governor of Florida involved in the case. And that was, of course, because of the media coverage that was involved. Also, my, Tiger Woods and how that impacted Kobe Bryant, Martha Stewart, Rodney King. How many of you remember the videos of the beating? Did that formulate an opinion? Did, did that infuriate the jury? So these are, these are cases that have gone on over the past few years that, of course, show the significance and impact of the law as well. And, and I'll give you a funny story. You remember that story about the uh, McDonald's case, the woman that spilt coffee on her lap? Okay, that's a, that's a media-friendly case also. That case has basically haunted me for 22 years of practice, because every time I go to a client and I bring him or her a significant settlement, the first thing they say to me is, that's it? The lady dropped coffee on her lap and she got a million dollars. Well, the problem is that that's the only thing that was published. What wasn't published was when it went up on appeal, she got zero. They dismissed the case. So again, how the media could help or hurt a situation. And it pissed me off because I didn't have the McDonald's case. Now you talk about other online social networks. And I want to give you a scenario of what can happen today with respect to the media and either the law or everyday life. Ten years from now, you're a student or your son or, or daughter or granddaughter or grandson goes for a job, they're a lawyer, you're really proud of them, and they got this big job in a big law firm. And they can't wait. They're talking to you the next day, tomorrow I'm going to start, I can't wait. They go in all dressed up, they're psyched. The boss sits down, shakes their hand, and he's walking them to the bathroom. And your son, grandson, granddaughter says, what are you doing sending me to the bathroom? And the boss says, well, this is your office. I said, why is my office? Well, you know, you remember 10 years ago when you friend requested me? When I went to your pictures on your Facebook, I see you had pictures of yourself on the toilet. So I think you like being photographed on the toilet, so I want you to do well in your office. What I'm trying to say is, is that there, something new, the media, Twitter, Facebook, these are treasure troves of evidence. What you do today on that Facebook, what you photograph on that Facebook, can help or hurt you in years to come. That's something that people weren't faced with many years ago, but it's something to always keep in mind. You might be a future senator, vice president, and the last thing you need to have is be holding a 40, picking your top up. There are some pros and cons, as you can already imagine, in the law and the media. The pros and cons vary on who the participants are, whether or not it's the defense attorney, the prosecutor, the judge, the litigant. Some pros of the mass media are they break cases and issues down. Well, if you didn't feel like reading that 3,000-page uh, bill, you put on CNN or Fox, and you then can have it broken down for you. The problem is, you don't know if it's broken down authentically. Newspapers and magazines have an audience, as some media mediums do. Fox might have one ideology, CNN might have another. And depending upon the issue that's presented or promoted, that would be the medium they use. There are various cons. Well, there's a lot of cons in the media, but cons of the media. Information reported may not be authentic. Remember, you may have an attorney spewing poison in the media, which his client, his or her client, may not be able to do in the court of law. Very big asset also can be a big detriment. 
unnecessary sensationalism of various issues. There may be a particular issue that is presented, for argument's sake, I just uh, represented recently former uh, New York Met Ed Cranepool in a case against the hospital where they produced writings and mailings where he was endorsing the hospital, which of course he did not, uh, to benefit their foundation and basically get more patients to the hospital. Uh, that's the use of the media, but of course it wasn't authorized and therefore it was improper and that was the basis of the federal lawsuit. There are various issues dealing with law and media and there are, can the media deter crime? Well, certainly it works with, uh, or can work with prostitution. Uh, someone might think twice of soliciting a prostitute if their photograph is going to be on a particular network and lives ruined. But uh, if you take something like, let's say, drunk driving, certainly that's not going to deter someone because when they're drinking and they get behind the wheel of a car, uh, nothing's going to deter them because they're slurred to begin with. Megan's law showed how effective it could be to put uh, persons that are convicted online to help the media, to help members of the community know what's going on. But public shaming works in different ways and it can work or it can't work depending upon the crime. I don't know if any of you have heard it. There's something called the CSI effect. The CSI effect is a very, very interesting um, report that was done, and there's significant truth to it. Basically, it's saying that this program, CSI, impacted how defendants were tried throughout the entire country. Ironically enough, jurors had inflated expectations of cases that lacked forensic evidence and basically were acquitting defendants in some cases where they would normally have been convicted. In fact, there have been prosecutors that were interviewed where they stated that it, it changed their burden of proof. It was hard enough to convict beyond a reasonable doubt. Now there was a higher standard. It was the standard according to the CSI. In fact, one of the best examples that's set forth in this report of a high-profile CSI potential acquittal was the Robert Blake murder case. In that case, the prosecutor presented significant motive and opportunity for Robert Blake to have murdered his wife. However, he was acquitted. And many believe that he was acquitted because the way and theory that the prosecutor determined that the crime was committed, mainly at close range, there was no forensic evidence of gun residue on him. And therefore, the jury didn't believe that he killed his wife. And many believe that that CSI effect hurt the prosecution in that case, and that's why he was acquitted. I think to, this, to wrap this up into a circumstance of understanding the issues regarding the balancing of the First Amendment and the Sixth Amendment is a case, if you've read, Nebraska Press versus Stewart. And basically, the Supreme Court considered the appropriateness of the strong measure taken by a judge in a closely fired uh, murder trial in Nebraska. In that case, which w went to the United States Supreme Court, it basically showed that you cannot take a preventative measure in order to stop the First Amendment right to free speech and press. The court in that case determined that it was too speculative and therefore overturned it. And I leave you with this 
concurrence by Justice Powell. Justice Powell stated in concurrence, in my judgment, a prior restraint may only issue when it's shown to prevent discrimination of prejudicial publicity that otherwise poses a high likelihood of preventing directly, irreparably, and impaneling the jury of the Sixth Amendment. And he gives, goes on to give a test. This requires a showing there is clear threat to the fairness of the trial. Such a threat is posed by the actual publicity to be restrained and no less restrictive alternatives are available. Thereby showing it's up to the trial judge to determine, it's hot in here, <laughs> whether or not uh, there should be a restriction or how much of a restriction on the media. Would you like to open up the questions? That'd be great. There's a few in, I think, both legal circles, or at least the circles of uh, legal scholars that, that look at this, and uh, to some degree, perhaps practitioners, that a lot of the time when we focus on media's treatment of cases, it's a little distorting because we're looking at the high profile cases. And the reality is the judicial system is millions of cases, right? We're talking about over 100 million cases litigated in, uh, in federal and state courts. So I guess to what degree do you think the, the comments you're making are representative or not of the judicial system as a whole? Obviously, there can be real problems in individual cases. The more high, high profile, the more cameras you're going to have in the courtroom. But the reality, uh, is, that's, that's the position I'm taking is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the reality is that in most of those cases, 90%, 95%, I don't know what the number is, but an awfully high percentage, there's not going to be that press attention. So the kinds of worries we have about uh, pervasive press coverage, about the influence of the press on juries and, uh, and potential uh, lawyers is, uh, is a very different conversation for, for most of our judicial system. Uh, the reality of it is, is the majority of cases um, in our country have no issue with the press and uh, paths don't even cross. It's of course these cases where either the issue is sensitive or sensationalized or the litigants or their representatives use it to their advantage. For argument's sake, the David Letterman case uh, would have normally been a regular blackmail case and no one ever would have heard anything about it. But given the players involved as well as the legal representative of the defendant in that case who chose to use the media to his advantage became a media uh, friendly issue. Okay, let me ask a follow up. Based on your, based on your own experiences then, uh, do you have, for other kinds of cases where there is this sort of pre prejudicial uh, risk, do you have any policy suggestions? Do you have any, uh, if you could wave the proverbial magic wand, are there any extra powers you'd give judges? Any uh, restrictions you would put into place so that there is less of a corrosive uh, impact? No, I, I think uh, today most judges have it down pat. You know, I think it, it all depends on the personality. Uh, I believe in the case of Judge Ito, way back with um, the uh, O.J. Simpson case, there might have been a little bit of a reason on his own to become a star and allow that circus. I think most judges today take their judicial responsibility and judicial temperament seriously and want to strike the balance between allowing a First Amendment right to access as well as a Sixth Amendment right to a fair trial. Up front. If I click on the internet and I go to one of the stories, you don't know who the person is, basically, and it's followed by a blog, and there's absolutely no credibility as far as I'm concerned. How do you feel about that? That is an excellent point, and it's one of, one of the biggest problems with media and law today, because when people click on that story, they think there's immediate authenticity. The truth of the matter is, no one knows who wrote it. It could be anonymous, or it could be, you know, just slanted for a cause, and that is one of the big problems today with the internet. You know, certainly there's a little more credibility or let's say accountability uh, when someone's going on TV, uh, in the newspaper, or on radio. I think the, in the internet you have a little bit more of an accountability problem because anyone could post anything, and unfortunately it gives the reader 
authenticity. And that is a problem, there's no doubt about it, and people just have to understand that and act accordingly. Professor Woolley has a question. Are you sympathetic to the Supreme Court's resistance to television cameras, and whether you are or not, can you make a case not to have the Supreme Court televised? Uh, I believe that the Supreme Court should be televised, you know, maybe on C-SPAN, where it's not uh, in thrusted upon someone, but they can go there if they wish to do so, or maybe even online. Uh, I think it's very important because most of the issues that, that are argued before the United States Supreme Court are constitutional issues, issues that affect each and every one of us in our lives every day, and we should have the ability to at least watch and see what's going on if there's anything that we can do. As a corollary to that point, if the Supreme Court were to be televised, whether it's on C-SPAN or, as you say, on the Internet, would you, in addition, advocate televising their deliberations? Uh, well, the deliberations, that's a very good question. That's, that's really an excellent question. Uh, that would be a little, a little hairy. Uh, that that I, I would not advocate for because I think it would be unfair to the justices themselves to have their deliberations exposed it would also give probably unfair advantage to some attorneys in subsequent cases. Uh, for argument's sake, there is a case right now before the United States Supreme Court. Um, it might be a little, I don't mean to be technical, there's something called honest services. I don't know if you ever, have you ever heard of this. It's a significant crime that federal prosecutors charge people with when they can't think of another crime to charge them with. It's called honest services. And, and that is before, right now, the United States Supreme Court, in the case of skilling, if you remember from the, uh, was it the Health um, Organization, Health South, and Conrad Black. Those cases are before the Supreme Court now. Now, these are important issues, and the public should know and be able to listen to the arguments presented uh, with respect to why or why not this law should, in fact, uh, be in existence. But the deliberations, I think, should be sensitive and secret to the justices and allowing only publication of what they feel in their opinion is just. There's but so that's much, only my opinion. There's so much interest in this topic, I think I'll write a 70-page article on it and then close out the Politics and the Public Mind series on it. Good suggestion. Other questions for Mr. Barron? Could you maybe talk a little bit to, uh, to our students directly about advice you have for them when it comes to thinking about legal careers and the prospects of going to law school in a environment that in 2010 isn't uh, always looking the most inviting. If there's anyone that really is dreaming of or aspiring to be an attorney, uh, it's a very bad job market out there, needless to say, in every environment. And what I do recommend is A, coming to more symposiums like this, under, trying to understand and network a little bit more what's going on, and also do internships. You know, uh, I was talking to a, a friend of mine who's a district attorney in New York, and um, he is not hiring very many more um, district attorneys because he's getting volunteers. People that want to work for two, three years, get good trial experience, become m more marketable in two, three years when there hopefully is a job, and come out and be able to try cases. You know, it's a lot better than sitting around throwing the football a frisbee and, you know, gaining weight. The truth of the matter is, is that it's a good idea not to sit back, not to whine that the economy is no good and that there won't be any jobs. Get your education or maybe even go for your LLM now and then, uh, then just try to get as many interns, internships as possible and as much experience as possible and uh, put something on your resume and get some knowledge that'll make you different than someone else three years from now, or four years from now when you're interviewing. I had a different kind of question. It's related, but it, it really uh, talks, it really relates more to the issue of jury selection. And uh, among, among the procedures for selecting a jury is this process of doing challenges for cause and peremptory challenges, and the basic goal is to come up with a pool of juries and ultimately a, a jury for a trial that is impartial or that at least is not prejudiced against or, or for the defendant or the parties involved in the case. And I take it that's related to some of what we're talking about today in the sense that 
you and other lawyers worry, uh, think about, strategize, think through the impact of the media on jury deliberations on how they'll decide a case. So the question is, you know, how much of that is a, uh, a realistic set of goals, and, and B, how much of it is a kind of constitutional set of goals when we have a commitment to being tried by a jury of your peers, right? That implies to some degree that the jury pool, that the jury trying your case will not be a, a series of robots, but that they will have a kind of local knowledge. That they'll know, uh, it could imply that they have a kind of sympathy for your background, and they are like, more like you than unlike you. So uh, the two questions are, one is in a kind of, in, in an environment where many people have blackberries, where it's harder and harder to uh, draw walls up around media influence, how realistic are our efforts to control the, the seepage of media, and secondly, uh, how desirable is the goal of having a kind of uh, automaton jury when we even in our constitution seem to seek something different. Sometimes selecting a jury is all in your head. And I'll give you a, a, a quick story. I tried a case in Supreme Court, New York, uh, many years ago. The case was for a doctor who had a, the overhead luggage compartment was opened by the flight attendant, and the stewardess opened it up, and she dropped a bag on his shoulder while he was sleeping. He sustained serious injuries. He was a general surgeon. I brought the stapling gun into, into the courtroom and everything, and I just thought I tried a great case. And I was getting psyched during this case because there was one guy on the juror. You remember when Sergio Tacchini tracksuits was big? Okay, this guy was wearing a Sergio Tacchini tracksuit. I was about 15 years younger, my hair was pushed back, and I'm just thinking I'm connecting with this guy the whole time. And I'm looking at him, and he's looking at me, and I'm saying to myself, this guy's with me. He's gonna tell everybody that my client got really hurt and everything. Well, anyway, at the end of the case, I lose the case. And, the, of course, the judge says, you may poll the jury. And I really didn't want to talk to any of them. In fact, I didn't want to look at them. But there's one guy I wanted to look at, and I wanted to walk up to him and say, what happened? And I walked up to him and I said, so what'd you think? And he said to me, your client was full of... So, look what happens. In my mind, I thought that our personalities were connecting, and it was the farthest from the truth. So the truth of the matter is what you, what you really believe sometimes is not as it is, but you do the best you can do. Uh, there are two situations which I want to comment on. In the federal court, what we're talking about is called voir dire. Voir dire is picking a jury. In the federal court, judges do the voir dire. In the state court, the lawyers do it. So sometimes it could be a little different in that respect also and more controlling environment in the federal court. Uh. In your experience, in certain cases where you have a choice between having a judge or, or a jury, uh, what do you think about that? Uh, Excellent question, and there is a significant science to that, at least I think I have a science. If it's, a, if it's an issue, let's say it's a commercial case, uh, maybe a disillusion of a business, partners stealing from each other, I really want a judge. Because if there are technical issues involved in the case, um, numbers related, I really want someone that's going to have the ability, not that jurors can have, think good or be smart, but I just want someone who's basically paid to look at the issues. Whereas if I have an issue where I want to maybe pull the wool over the eyes of a jury or, you know, be a little showman or whatever the case may be, that doesn't go with a judge. He'll bounce you on your head. Then you want a jury. So it really depends on the kind of case that you're trying. Are you in favor of the uh, professional jury consultants? Never use them. Uh, many, many, many people do. I am not in favor of them. First of all, I just have a problem with paying somebody to tell me something about somebody that I can't know myself. Um, you know, you didn't, you didn't pay somebody to pick your wife. And I think it's a problem paying somebody to pick your jury. So I, I know a lot of guys that use it, uh, but I've never done it, and I have a problem with doing it. Hi. One of the um, media that most influences public attitudes toward the law is the movies. Can you tell us what your favorite movie about lawyers is and what your least favorite movie about lawyers is? I don't, can't think of many that comes to my mind. I, I, I certainly like, you know, 
movies re revolving around legal. Um, the problem is, of course, many, many times they're not authentic or they're, they're not actual, uh, but, you know, none come to my mind immediately, but there's a lot that I like, and there's a lot that I dislike. I have a kind of follow up to that. What, what, uh, is there a particular popular culture, or at least popular notion about lawyers themselves that you think is the most uh, abused or the least uh, true? You mentioned the Stella Leibach case. Are there you know, other, other issues that you think are uh, some of the most widely uh, misconceived ideas about, about attorneys and their work? Well, unfortunately, uh, attorneys sometimes are placed in the same category as real estate agents and uh, what other, some other, what's that, used car salesmen? That's right. Uh, I like to think of myself as a new car salesman, not a used car salesman. But uh, now listen, you have, you have your good and bad in every profession. Uh, unfortunately, I think that the reason some lawyers get a bad name or have gotten in historically is because maybe uh, they were more educated and used that education incorrectly and took advantage of their clients or, you know, their adversaries. Uh, but the reality of it is, is that um, I believe as an attorney, you have a fiduciary responsibility, not only to your client, but to the profession that you act with utmost decorum and you, you know, you, you act as a, as a gentleman or, or uh, a, you know, a young lady and, and still be able to advocate on behalf of your client. I mean, I, I've been known actually to be extremely aggressive. I try to put my 300 pounds to use for me or for my client, but no matter how aggressive or no matter how vicious I can get on behalf of my client and my client's cause, at no time do I ever uh, stop to be respectful and uh, uh, act as a gentleman. Why is there so much litigation and is it good or bad? Uh, I have to put my kids through school. <laughs> uh, look, we, we have to really thank God for the fact that, that we have our system and it allows us to litigate our disputes in court. It's a great system. Unfortunately, it, it doesn't always work well, but, it, but it's a great system. And, you know, you have to have, sometimes it doesn't work well because, believe it or not, you know what the worst problem is? Let's say it's a money dispute. The lawyer has to do the same amount of work to advocate your position, whether it's a $5,000 dispute or a $5 million dispute. And unfortunately, that's what drives the wedge between the client and the lawyer. But it's a very good system, I believe, and it's, it's the best system in the world. And, you know, I mean, look, there are frivolous litigations, there's no doubt about it. Uh, and, and every day, legislatures are enacting various legislation to curtail frivolous litigation. But for the most part, it works. Uh, we spoke earlier in this series with another speaker about um, justices who are uh, being appointed or elected to office. I just wanted to get your feelings on how do you feel about justices having to, um, you know, I guess pander to the voters and, and go through the election process, and does that affect their decisions? Well, there, there are definitely pros and cons with um, election of judges and appointment of judges. Uh, you can certainly make arguments for and against both. Just because somebody runs a campaign and wins doesn't mean they had integrity or they were the best candidate for the job. It could have mean they spent a lot of money on their campaign. It could mean that they have a significant family uh, background in the area that pushed for them. And on the appointment thing, it could mean politics could play, you know, a big role into it too. So, you know, again, it's a system that has worked well, but you can certainly make arguments for and against each. How about the role of public opinion? Is there a role of public opinion in the work of, of judges? I mean, we seem to invite it with something like uh, cruel and unusual punishment, right? That could be seen as a kind of invitation to thinking about what the public regards as unusual. Do you think there's a broader role for, the, for judges to consider public opinion, or is that really taboo when it comes to legal construction? Well, definitely, definitely judges should never, ever uh, put their own feelings their own uh, um, experiences or anything into the case. A judge is supposed to sit, apply the facts to the law, and interpret it as such by the plain letter of the law. In your, ad in your advocacy for the Supreme Court to be set televised, just as uh, the attorneys have to uh, have 
uh, past uh, legal requirements in education, would you advocate that those same attorneys have some theatrical uh, background and uh, experience in graduation? Well, I, in the United States Supreme Court, quite frankly, I think there's only one particular actor who's allowed, and that's Anton Scalia. I don't think any lawyer is going to outdo him, uh, and I think if they do, he'll be, they'll be bounced. So uh, I think when you argue before the United States Supreme Court, I'm not saying that any other judge uh, uh, is smarter or less, less smarter uh, than the United States Supreme Court, but when you get to that level, it's issue-oriented and uh, theatrics goes out the window, because if it doesn't, you will. In the uh, case of the uh, students in Duke, um, and uh, they're ultimately being exonerated, um, would you advocate that a uh, district attorney or anybody else in that sort of a situation with that kind of power, if he abuses his power in that fashion, it's true he was disbarred, uh, but should he be uh, able to be sued uh, by, the, by the offended parties? Um, in, in this particular case, the... Uh, should he be able to be sued by the offending parties? In this particular case, I can imagine these people probably significantly impaired. Yeah. Uh, basically, the gentleman wanted to know if, if the Duke lacrosse students who were wrongfully accused should be entitled to sue uh, DA Nifong individually as opposed to being indemnified by the city of Durham. It's an interesting question, and there is sort of an immunity. Of course, in a lawsuit like that, the city would move to say that he did not act within the scope of his employment, uh, sim simply because he is there to prosecute criminals, not to create more business for the courts. The problem is that, from the standpoint as a litigator, when I look at this, uh, there's not much that you can get from Mike Nifong. So if I'm suing him, I want him to be indemnified by the city of Durham. They have the deep pockets. The question becomes, was there a red light in the past? Did, did they know that this zealot was out there just to put notches on his belt? And therefore, they indemnify him on the deep pockets. Because the truth of the matter is, you wind up with an empty judgment against the prosecutor in that case. And Duke University had culpability as well because they jumped the gun. You know, they, they threw the Constitution right out the window. What happened to presumption of innocence? They immediately fired the, the, the lacrosse coach. They immediately expelled the students. Well, they suspended them. But you know what? They were wrong. And it's funny, at the time, I don't know how many years back, I used to do a show, uh, Rita Cosby, uh, live and direct on MSNBC, and I was on almost every night on this particular topic. And I believed at the time that the district attorney was acting outside the scope of his employment. He was acting as the executioner, he was acting as the judge, he was acting as, you know, the police. And, and it was just obvious that he was railroading these kids. And it was amazing that even when the DNA was not proper, that he still went forward. And there it goes, the, the old adage that, you can, that a district attorney can indict a ham sandwich. Those are three ham sandwiches. Uh, but please join me in thanking Bruce Barron for joining us today.